It's episode 228 of the Cassius Morris Show. Thanks for tuning in to this brand new edition of the podcast. We have an awesome guest lined up for you guys today. I'm really excited about this. But before we jump into it, I wanted to tell you guys a little experience that I had uh, just two weekends ago here in Canada. The reason I say here in Canada is because we had our Thanksgiving um, on the weekend of October 11th. It comes about a month before the U.S. Thanksgiving, I believe. So I, I usually tend to post about the U.S. holidays when I do post. Call me a traitor, call me whatever. Um, I'm just trying to stick with the main thing that my followers know. Um, but I did decide to celebrate a little bit because it also fell on the weekend of my father's birthday, which was on the 11th. So conjoined celebratory uh, occasions here. So I went down there to celebrate. Now, naturally, since I just had a concussion and I'm still kind of clawing back from it, like I'll go two weeks feeling perfect and then start to get symptoms. But I hadn't drank, obviously, a sip of alcohol since it had happened, since I was, you know, off work for weeks, basically in bed for almost two months. Uh, alcohol wasn't even in my vocabulary for a good at least two months, if not two and a half. So this was my first time really going ahead and celebrating since I felt fine. Went over to my dad's uh, and my mom's. We were hanging out. All of a sudden, some craft beers come out. We're starting to try some craft beers. All of a sudden, some craft uh, liquors come out, some craft gin, some vodka. Um, I'm sampling and taste testing. I feel like the Pope. I'm drinking so much communion. Uh, it was, you know, a lot of good stuff. And I, whatever, I figured I would partake. So next thing you know, we've been partaking for a little while. I'm a little drunk. I'm a little fucked up at this point. Listen, everybody gets a little fucked up every once in a while. I was a little fucked up. So, okay, I'm feeling good, whatever. I had a couple drinks. It was, it was all good stuff. It was enjoyable. I'm not sloppy or anything. So I head home, and uh, I'm scrolling through Instagram. I'm hanging out. Now, I'm, I'm wavy at this point. I'm feeling good. And I see on my Instagram a startup that I've been following, because I look at a lot of music startups. They're going live, and they had a few hundred people watching, and it was a hip-hop talent discovery live stream. So I'm a, little, I'm a little happy, and I take a look at this and I say, you know what's the best idea for me to do right now? This is the perfect time for me to go on this live stream and freestyle rap. Now just for the record, I can freestyle, but this was not the time or place to be doing anything publicly whatsoever. I honestly also didn't think I was going to get into the live stream because obviously when there's hundreds of people watching, the chances are low. So I hop in this live stream and I just clicked add me. The second I request, I'm thrown into the stream. So now I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I load in, I start talking. It's clear I'm a little happy. It's clear I'm a little buzzed up. So the host goes, how you doing? I go, oh, I'm all right, I'm good. He goes, how good are you? And that was the moment, my friends, that I knew I was fucked. I knew I was fucked. And I proceed to do probably the worst abomination of a performance attempt that has ever been known to man. The quote-unquote performance that I provided was the equivalent of a guy telling you he's going to juggle, throwing the balls up in the air, and they all fall back on the ground. That's how terrible this so-called freestyle was. Um, and I absolutely bombed. I'm literally saying it, I'm going, and I'm seeing trash can emojis just flooding the chat. And the worst part was, I'm sitting there reading it thinking, these guys are dead on. This is absolute trash. Um, definitely not my best moment. I thought it was goddamn hilarious though. It was almost like the freestyle rap version of a Spinal Tap moment. Uh, guy coming in with the confidence that he can, he can slay it and kill anything and absolutely bomb. Uh, so listen, you can't take yourselves too seriously. You gotta laugh at yourself sometimes. Sometimes you go to make a courageous choice um, and you fuck up and you bomb. But then I thought about how many comedians I love um, and all these performers that I love and how many times they've bombed and how many times they've talked about how they needed to bomb in order to get where they needed to go. So I, I ate my slice of humble pie. Um, it definitely taught me a lesson. And just for the record, I think I've been pretty damn good. I've never had an experience like that. I think I've been pretty good in the 10 years I've been using the internet, so I got a pretty clean slate. So let's, uh, let's look at this one as a slap on the fingers, and we move on. 
Today's guest on the podcast is the one and only Chloe Trujillo, a awesome, incredible artist, model, um, and musician who creates her own music. She's now producing her own music. Um, definitely very well known in the European art scenes, uh, definitely the metal scene all around the world, and of course the New York scene just in general, just really a staple if you ask people who are really in the know about music, entertainment, anything like that. This is really uh, one of the names that they will definitely say rings a bell. And Chloe's brand new album has just come out. Mothers of a New Nation is available on your favorite streaming service. And make sure to check out Chloe's website. We have all of her links in the bio or description on your Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Also in the YouTube. And really just a pleasure to talk with her. We did have a little issue with the Zoom this time. I did two shows back to back this day and we had a little issue with the Zoom. So for some reason, it only is showing Chloe. It's not showing me, you can hear me fine. I was sort of debating what to do with this. I was like, should I just put it out on audio or should I just you know, figure something out? And at the end of the day, I decided to put it out the way it is because the reality I think is that 90% of people who listen to this on YouTube or watch it are watching it while they're doing something else. You're probably cooking right now, you're probably cleaning right now you're probably doing homework or at the gym something like that so i know that this content is grade a there's some incredible stories in here and some stuff that really needs to get out so i'm just going to let you guys have this uh frankly obviously it's chloe's a lot better looking than me uh so it could be a lot worse if it was just me we'd have a serious problem all jokes aside really appreciate chloe coming on the show and i know you guys are going to enjoy this podcast so enough of my blathering away and enjoy my conversation with Chloe Trujillo. Hey, what's going on? Uh, well, not much. I'm uh, in an Airbnb in the middle of nowhere. So I hope, fingers crossed, that the internet so far so good. I hope you can hear me okay. I can. So far, so good. So so we're traveling right now. Is, is this to do with the record or is this just, just for pleasure type of thing? No, uh, uh, it was while well, we were uh, in uh, Sacramento because my son played uh, with Suicidal. Um, when was it? Saturday? Friday. Friday. Nice. So, and then we uh, went to visit friends and now we're on our way back to, uh, to L.A. So uh, we we'll just spend the night here in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> middle of nowhere. But, it could be yeah. fun sometimes though. So so your son is was playing with suicidal. Was that a was that a relationship that's been going for a while or was this sort of a newer thing? Oh no, uh uh well, he, he only played uh I think four shows uh with them because their bass player uh Ra is uh, uh was playing with Corn. He had played with them, I believe it was what 2017, 2018 for just one show in uh, San Pedro. And then he played with them um, with Infectious Grooves, which is the, the same, uh, kind of the same crew uh, in Brazil uh, that same year. I can't remember, it was 2018 maybe or 2017. So yeah, wow. it was really cool. I mean, it was like that last show here in uh, uh, Sacramento was just amazing, full of energy it was really, you know, insane energy. And I mean, it, it must be a lot of people getting out for their first concerts since I know. the pandemic, right? I know. I almost had tears in my, cause I, you know, we were uh, on the stage behind and just seeing the mosh pit and, and the wall of death and all this stuff and everybody, I think it's just, you know, uh, I, I wanted to go out there, but I'm still not ready. I'd be like, like spraying yeah. my sanitizer, like <laughs> <laughs> mask in the, in the mosh pit. Isn't it? Isn't that metal? I guess <laughs> that's classic. Uh, you know, I know it's a, it's a really cool time for you. Cause you have the, the new album out your second studio album. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of questions about this. First of all, you tried sort of a different release strategy for this. Cause you were releasing videos and songs sort of leading up to the full, uh, drop. I'm just curious, how did you find that that resonated with uh, the people that listen to your music? Uh, I, you know, it just happened that way. Um, we decided to release uh, one single a month until, you know, the full release date with like, you know, there's two bonus tracks. And I've always uh, thought it's, it's always cool. I always like to watch music videos. I always like to have a visual along with the music. 
um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I listen to a lot of music in my car, obviously, and I can't see, you know, I, I enjoy it that way too. But if I'm going to be sitting down uh, and listening to music, I always have to, uh, I mean, I'm a visual person. I, you know, I'm a painter too. So uh, um, I, I always like visuals. And the way it happened is, is uh, um, I had uh, this this woman I knew, which was friends with my sister, and we had met a few times at like parties or gatherings. And she is a filmmaker, and she works a lot on uh, mostly commercial advertisement film. And so when I decided to make videos, I thought I'd just ask her questions for um, just advice like oh what do you think and right. and and this discussion led into just send me your tracks and and i'll see uh and it led to oh let's i love i love this first song you send me uh i'm i'd be happy to do a video i can see it like this like this and then and then that led you know one thing that led to the next and then now we have like i don't know nine videos it's together. like a snowball effect yes because uh, um, because i like to work with people i get along with and and when it's you know all the videos we just had a great time shooting them you know it's work but it's when you work with with the right people and and there's no you know no stress no tension no it just kind of happened naturally and um so that's how it, you know, and I didn't even look elsewhere right now for now to, to have anybody else do my videos. So, you know, I would send her a new song and, and she has ideas and I have ideas and we kind of meet and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a mutual respect. Like I totally respect her ideas and, and let's do it. And, and I'm down for anything. So, yeah. And that's that's how yeah that's how it all happened so yeah you you mentioned being a, a visual artist and how that sort of impacts the visuals with the music um d does the painting and the art does that affect making music for you in other ways or, or is it not really there totally it's uh it's so the way like my creative process both are very very linked uh, um, you know, I'd be painting and then during the, that process, I will have melodies or words that come to me. So I always have, um, I always have my phone nearby that way I can keep painting, but just record the ideas and, you know, vice versa. When I'll be writing music, I have visuals that come into mind. So I have like a little sketchbook and I, and I draw what I, whatever I see. Um, and those paintings are not, or visuals are not necessarily end up in a video because the, uh, it, that's the process of creation. So it's already, it's already done, you know, it's already made, it's made before the video. Um, but yeah, they work hand in hand for me. And every time uh, in my life, I, you know, cause you have a people trying to advise you like, oh, you get to pick one thing. You can't be doing both. Like you're spreading your, yourself too thin and, you do like your designing, you do your paintings, uh, your artwork, and, and then you do music. And, you know, if you want to have like, you know, success faster in, in a certain area, you just have to focus on one thing. And every time I did so, uh, it never worked out for me. It's, it's funny because, mm. you know, I moved to New York and, and uh, first from, I'm from Paris, France. And in Paris, I was doing the same thing. Um, and when I moved to New York is through an audition. Uh, so it was mostly through music because of singing. And that got me my visa. And ah. to keep your visa, you have to work in the same field. You know, you cannot, I cannot, I was not allowed to uh, grab any job. And that would not, you know, uh, let me have my work visa, my work permit. Okay. So, so, um, so then in my head, I'm like, okay, so that's a sign I'm just going to focus on music. Mm. And then all of a sudden the art, like art opportunities started creeping. <laughs> it's just funny how it, you know, the universe works. It's like, oh, you know, I became friends with this great artist in New York. Um, and then we started uh, doing things together. And then like all of a sudden art became part of my life again. 
mm. along with music. And, and same thing, when I moved to LA, um, I had more art opportunities first and I thought, okay, well, maybe I just focus on art. And then, you know, and then I start singing in a band called 66 Steps and, and then we started doing shows and then I was writing my own stuff and just music stuff kept, you know, it just, yeah. So wow. I guess I'm meant to be, bo to do both. It was unavoidable <laughs> because it, it sounds like it was really just on your path and really it, it was yeah. less of a matter of choice almost. It, exactly. And, and, you know, every time you resist something, it's, it doesn't work out. It's just like you encounter a wall and it's just not, you know, so I, I just go with the flow and, and, and that's what I'm supposed to do. That's how everybody's supposed to just follow their intuition and their path. And, you know, it's, it just, uh, things fall into place, uh, magically somehow. Um, yeah. It definitely you know. appears to. I mean, it, it's it's pretty wild how that works. And I, I know that being from Paris, uh, your mother was a model and your father was also in the fashion business. Yeah. Um, what was your sort of art exposure in Paris? And at that point, were you sort of uh, known in the art scene or did that sort of come when you came to America? Well, well, first of all, yeah, my parents, my mom was a model and uh, my dad was a fashion designer. And then together they create their own brand. And so I grew up around this whole fashion, Parisian fashion world. And they dressed a lot of artists, musical artists and, and um, you know, mostly uh, French, but also American artists because they, then they start growing their business and, and they, uh, they went, um, you know, they were invited for uh, uh, personal appearances in New York or uh, in LA or, you know, uh, all around the world, basically. And so I was always around a lot of art. And they also were, like, my mom was always painting, you know, on, on her time off. She was doing oil paintings. Her things were, like, angels and things like that. She mm. was, <laughs> but but she made the, everything look very antique. And I remember she used, I remember the smell of the varnish that made the paint crack looking at it, it was old paintings and and so mm. I grew up around that um and they were also art lovers um so we we traveled a lot and uh and so we saw a lot of art all around the world whether it's uh uh I mean we travel uh, in the Middle East we traveled all over Europe of course I mean the U.S. Uh, but um, we get, I, I say we because I have two sisters and we were exposed to a lot of art, um, you know, all our lives. So it, you know, of course it impacted me. Um, and I grew up in center Paris. I mean, I was going to the Louvre all the time. I was going to the, all the different museums in Paris. Uh, and then when I, I was, you know, I first started in studying science. That's a long story. But uh, right. when I moved, switch into art school, then you have a, a all access passes to every museum in Paris uh, for free, and you skip lines and and you just enter and and I would go in there and sketch and and just enjoy the art. So I've always, yeah, I, I grew up around a lot, a lot of art and artists. I. Uh, um, and that's the visual part, but also music. Uh, my grandfather was also a, I mean, it's not the same style of music, but he was a professional opera singer. Nice. Uh, and both because my parents had long working hours. And when we were little, uh, my grandparents were actually my second set of parents. So we also gotcha. grew up with my grandparents a lot, you know, and he was always singing and doing his vocal warm ups mm. and, like he had this big bass baritone voice and, and, um, you know, so, so I was always inspired to, uh, uh, to do music and, and art. And I never, you know, my dad weirdly, cause he came from a very, very poor family and he left uh, home when he was 14 and then he built this fashion thing. Um, cause he's very smart at business, um, and also very creative. 
but he and I'm the oldest of the three uh, uh, sisters and so I think I had the most pressure that's why I studied science first because I was very I'm mm. a good mathematician <laughs> right okay so so you uh, wanted to sort of try to carry the family legacy in a science doctor kind of way well, yeah, well, the thing is, my dad could never afford to do, even though, you know, it's it's free to to study in France, but you have to have certain grades and I had great grades. And and I think my dad in his mind, because I was good at math, he was expecting what he could not do himself and, mm-hmm. and think, OK, my daughter, she can have a great career of being like an engineer or being something, you know, in, in the scientific field. Uh, but I was always drawing and so I got very confused at a young age you know I was like I don't know you know you know (laughs) at one point even though my dad is an artist and made it as a a fashion designer he's trying to tell me like the easiest way for career and and success you know like oh pursue science but deep inside I was an artist but you know at a young age it's really confusing because you're like searching for your identity so yeah. It made me, um, yeah. But You're now listening I, to other, I, other influences. Yeah, but now I accept it all, you know, because uh, I, I never think, I don't think it's time wasted, you know, all these studies. Uh, you know, it's it, even though I don't use uh, uh, math per se every day, but, uh, um, you know, it's still... It's it, still it, knowledge, it right? Mind. Yeah, it, it just shapes your mind in a different way and and i'm i'm still fascinated by um you know new um you know uh, uh, everything that's being uh discovered whether it's it's uh, uh the physics like the reality nowadays because it's it's kind of joining force between like quantum physics quantum mechanics and and all this i've always been fascinated by that so mm-hmm. so uh i guess yeah and the logical mind and 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 all that stuff but yeah <laughs> see this is cool i love this so so when you were traveling all the time did that make it easier for you to relocate to New York or was it still a super big adjustment? It's, it's okay. So it was really hard because I didn't know anybody in New York and, and yes, I, I was working, so um, I was busy, but, um, but I was working all the time. I never had like a moment off really. And it was really uh, like the high energy of New York, even though Paris is also high energy. I had plenty of friends and, and, uh, uh, and over there, I felt like, okay, I, I just, there was like a freeing feeling because I felt like, okay, nobody has any expectations of me because nobody knows me. And I could be whoever I want to be. This is free, freeing, this is so great. But at the same time, it's scary because, you know, there's no, um, and I didn't even have uh, 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 money to like have, I mean, the room I, I had when I first moved to New York, um, that's a book in itself where I <laughs> stayed because I stayed in a apartment building where the land, the new landlord wasn't allowed to kick out the old tenants. And it was a, um, uh, an old mental institute where they were treat, <laughs> treating like yeah um seriously mentally heal people and drug addicts so wow. i had to share bathrooms <laughs> with some crazies and there was um so the the toilet had, was a room and then shower is a different room but we all had to share it and then mm. there was this crazy lady with a shopping cart that would lock herself in the toilet at night um so we can use the 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 toilet in uh, at night which was interesting because i always have to pee in the middle of the night for some who time. doesn't right but it was like yeah <laughs> so and then you know roaches everywhere uh a lady died on the seventh floor it took them a week to find her her body uh wow. the smell was horrendous uh there was this crazy guy that one day i forgot to close my door i just got in and he was like in my door frame and he was not moving and he was all like all pale white and mumbling and i'm like oh my god what do i do (laughs) oh my god it's just these kind of things so new york was kind of 
a little crazy for me, but, um, but. <laughs> so what's it like in Paris? Is, is there a, a lot of stuff like that in different parts of Paris or is it less? Uh, I mean, I, I experienced everything in my life, you know, you know, my, you know when my parents, I grew up um, around Saint-Germain, um, Saint-Germain-des-Prés, uh, which is uh, Rive Gauche in Paris, but also in Léal. And there's a melting pot of all kinds of people. So I grew up around that. And then when I got into music and metal and punk rock, I even like stayed in squats and, and slept in the subway just you know, with my punk rock friends and being all punk and all this. So I experienced a whole spectrum. Uh, the thing that was different is I was always with a, a, a group of my punk rock friends and, and mm -hmm. you know, um, and we had like a couple of homeless dudes that were older that were hanging out with us and they were a little bit crazy and, they, and some of them were on drugs and all this. So I experienced that kind of similar thing, but this, I was living there, um, uh, for a month and I didn't know anybody <laughs> and it was like just you know uh, um, you know I have super long hair showers in the morning I remember uh, I had sometimes it was just drips of water and I'm like oh. I'm trying to wash my hair with drips uh, they there's the ceiling collapse on me because um, I was on the 10th floor which was the last floor of that building and it had snowed and then the snow melted and oh. somehow it seeped through uh, the roof to my ceiling. And at like four or 5 a.m., ice cold water whoosh, on me oh. on my mattress. And, and, you know, like it was just like one thing. I, I mean, you know, it's part of life, but uh, that was like my experience in New York and traveling. I mean, I'm easy to travel. I was never scared of of traveling really but uh, but this made, made it difficult but to move the idea of uh to backtrack from paris i just had survived a really uh horrendous attack uh where i had to fight for my life and it was uh um uh like a serial killer rapist in paris that I eventually got caught but i did fight and um, so I survived this and that's what made me um, more fearless in a way. Because mm -hmm. when I heard, a friend of mine told me about this audition in New York. And if I hadn't survived, I mean, who knows, you know, the, 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 I, I don't know, but I feel that it gave me the extra strength to go for this audition. Uh, because, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I might have not had the confidence or I might have been fearful, but I was in a mindset. I was like, okay, I just fought for my life. I just, you know, I was like all pumped up. I was like, what else do I got to lose? I don't care. You know, and, and I went for it. And then, you know, three months, it took them three months to give me, um, uh, finally let me know that I got the audition and then, you know, going through the embassy and consulate and getting visas situated and wow. everything uh but that was also the step that made me give me the the courage and the strength to uh just go for it um so you know it's a lot of like the road is not always like smooth and you know it's like a lot of bumpy road but um it was uh it all worked out yeah i mean wow that's that's so incredible so so when you beat this attacker so you mm -hmm. later found out like this was a known person in Paris. How did, how did that work exactly? Well, okay. So, um, just a briefly summary, the way it happened is somebody followed me in my apartment building at it's two in the afternoon, you know, you don't have your guard up at two in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, at night I'm always like careful. And that guy just grabbed me, head butted me, trying to knock me out in my head against the stairs and all this. And, and then I, I had, you know, threatening, you know, I didn't know if he had a weapon because he's like, I'm going to kill you if you make one noise and try to rip my pants. Like he actually ripped my pants. I was, you know, and, and I'm like, and I know he was not, you know, my bag had fallen down the stairs. So he was not after my thing and, and my things or anything. Um, he was after me. And, and then I had like a flash you know, there was like a little window and I looked at this guy and I'm like, I'm not going to die this way or whatever. And I turned around and I just started fighting and we fought for 20 minutes. I know the, the time because 
by the time I ran, so he started, after 20 minutes, he ran out the door and then there were two girls walking in the street and I was like, my head was all bloody. And my pants were down. I was still wearing underwear, but I was like, my pants were down. And so one girl uh, grabbed me in her arms and then the other girl called, um, uh, you know, the equivalent of 911 in France. Uh, right. So the firemen came and they did a quick, uh, you know, all this. And then they took me to the hospital to get checked. Everything is okay. They offered me like psychiatric services. And I was like, no, no, I just don't, I, I want to, you know, just deal with it. Um, I couldn't go home, you know, in my apartment for a while because every time I walked the steps, it was just, so I stayed with a friend and I stayed with a different friend. And then I worked through the stuff and then I'm trying to forget. And then within, I think two or three weeks, the police calls me to do a, a, a portrait, like, a, you know, those, those portrait. And all I, I was trying to do for those weeks is for all those days is forget the face of this person and just try to move on with my life. And now they're asking me like an accurate, like, so they wanted you to identify the, the suspect. Yeah. Okay. And that's when it started. And that's when they realized that that guy was the guy they were looking for, for a long time, because the way he got his victims were always in the middle. It was always the same way, following the, them in their apartment and, and doing exactly like middle afternoon, doing exactly this. And then when I gave my portrait, it, it kind of matched what they had. Mm -hmm. um as far as suspect and then they called me and and it was like a movie you know like when you see like behind the glass the, the mirror and they call up a, a bunch of dudes and um and deep into my heart was just like oh my god I can't I don't know if I can stand seeing that person you know it was just like and um anyway that's how I found out uh later on that that was that guy um wow so but luckily I made like this really cool friend was a police inspector, which I'm still friends with to this day. And she just took such great care of me and making sure that um, I was safe. And there was, you know, uh, uh, always a patrol around my apartment building and all this and, and made me. Uh, yeah, but it was it was scary times. Um, quite quite an adventure of, uh, you know, a mind like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, geez, so next level and obviously commend you for being a survivor. And I mean, it's, it's obviously an incredible thing. So by the time you went to New York, I mean, you were, you were pretty much ready for anything at that point. Yeah. That's why, that's why I feel like, you know, you always see the blessing in disguise after a fact of, of things, you know, you, you hear people, uh, survive different, um, experiences and and time tells like okay this was a blessing in disguise because you were going to the wrong direction and it's true because in in Paris at the time um of the time of the attack it's almost it was almost like a kick like I mean it was an attack but it was almost the universe telling me like I was going the wrong direction because it, it was a moment in my life where I uh, was almost losing faith in, in, uh, in myself and in my ability, like everything, wh whether it was uh, my music or my art or, you know, I, I just, I was in a bad space and that kind of switch, I mean, it made me in the worst space, but then it kind of brought me back up. Uh, and yeah, that, that was, yeah, that was definitely um, a blessing in disguise at the end but you don't see it right away. <laughs> yeah, no, and I mean, that, that takes such insight. Did, were you always that way where you could see sort of the good in a bad situation or did, did it take you a lot of evolution and time for that? I, uh, it, it always takes some evolution. I mean, I always had a little bit of that, but not to that degree, you know, it's always, uh, um, yeah. And then with, with life experience, um, you know, I start seeing more and more the truth in, in that, you know, so yeah, but I had a little bit, but not, you know, when something that or if, you know, I, I talk about it, I'm, I'm fine talking about it, it took me a long time to be okay, uh, t telling that story. Uh, 
but because now I see the blessing in disguise, I can I can tell the story and hopefully uh, uh, people that are in similar situations will see, you know, just see there's, you know, there's something after, there's a life after it and then just, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, it's totally inspiring for people. And, and again, appreciate you sharing that. So I obviously we want to let people know about the new record. Yeah. Um, it's produced by Tommy Daughtry. Yeah. Um, what exactly is the relationship there? Were you a hip hop fan? Was it a personal relationship? You no, know, not at all. I met him. So I was uh, uh, rehearsing a, a cabaret that uh, uh, that this woman that I met at a friend's party had written. Hmm. And uh, she's the one that introduced me because she knew I was writing music. And, and at that time, I was not uh, using uh, any software, anything. I was like, kind of like, I, I have my ideas. I can play them on the piano or on the keyboard and, and, and on the guitar, and then I can sing the melodies. But I ha I was always reluctant to use any kind of computer because I thought I had a little block with computers. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, oh, you got to, I got to um, introduce you to uh, Tommy D and, and, and uh, maybe you guys can work. He's an engineer and, and downtown. And so then I went there and, you know, we were just talking about the universe. And it's so funny because his studio, Tommy D's studio is in a building that has a bunch of music studios, but the top floor was where I had made my handbags as a designer that was the manufacturer. Wow. And because I, when I pulled up in this building, I was like, oh my God, I know this building. <laughs> I've been here. I've worked there before. And I'm like, I know exactly. And so it was like, I, I, I treated it as a sign. You know, I'm like, I'm supposed to be here because this 100%. is what I, you know, um, and even the first time I went to meet Tommy D, I, I had to go upstairs and, and say hi to the people that did my, uh, my bags, you know, a couple of years prior to that. Of course. Uh, but uh uh but yeah he worked I, I didn't know much about him she just told me oh yeah he worked as an engineer he uh uh worked uh uh death row records and all this and i'm like oh yeah i love all that stuff you know i love nwa dr dre um yeah i'm i'm like you know i'm mostly metal but i listen to a lot of like i like the the, the ex more extreme part of you know music. yeah a lot of relation there with with any sort of extreme music. Yeah, so so it was cool. So I I had brought uh, one of my songs that was almost uh, finished. You know, it, it was just as far as a demo part. I had played on the keyboard and and record. I still recorded. You know, I had I was using Garage Band at that time because I was like, I'm not getting anything else. I'm just gonna mess mess around with it. And and I recorded my vocals. Uh, I recorded the keyboard, like the bass line, and, and I recorded some guitars and all this. And he, like, you know, he got the file and he put it all in on, uh, well, he was working with Pro Tools. So, you know, I, I you know, separated the tracks and re-recorded everything. And then, and then he had all these really cool beats, you know, from working all this with the rap artist and hip hop and all this. And I'm like, oh, I dig that. You know, it's just like, I like, I like the mix, and then we we uh, uh, got along very well, uh, and so we got all the songs uh, pretty much done, but not like as as far as demos, and and mm -hmm. we started recording, um, you know, uh, drummers and guitar players uh, to try to finalize the tracks, and I, and I was going to record my vocals and and all that. And then COVID hit and everything got shut down. And, and so uh, for me to be able to finish everything, um, I had to, to uh, go beyond that threshold of <laughs> learning how to use. So I got myself a, a, a Logic Pro uh, because I was using, you know, GarageBand and it was like very similar. So, so when I started learning um, and tried and finish all the tracks on my own, um you know so yeah uh Man. but he yeah it was a great uh it was great working with him and uh uh it just because he had like a library of beats and 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 he brought in some some great stuff so 
Yeah. Sounds like he's the man. And, and I mean, the album is so, so cool. You know, just so many Thank different you. twists. And, yeah, so many twists and turns and just it's not predictable. It's, yeah. it's you no, know, that's what I really like about it. And obviously some family connections on the record, too. Um, and of course, in, in the videos, you know, obviously probably not the most original question in the world, but what's the dynamic when it comes to working with family on music? Is it harder or easier? Well, this was pretty easy because uh, my songs were already written. So for example, it, it was also something um, that I was reluctant to do before, but because mm. COVID and lockdown and I needed, for example, I would have never asked my husband to play on anything because he has his stuff going on and uh, and I you know I like to keep I, I mean it was really fun to to have him participate but you know I was always kind of like oh I know he's busy and and you know whatever uh, excuse I would make but um, I needed to have a real bass sound because all my basses were basically mostly keyboard oh, wow. or Tommy D had played some basses but there were the demo stage so there it did not sound the exact way we wanted to to sound uh, at the end so i uh, i got my uh, courage together and i'm like hey <laughs> <laughs> i think you could play those bass line for me and and that's how it started and it was really cool and especially it was cool hearing from him uh giving me uh, uh compliments on on my bass lines that i wrote Hey, there you go. High praise. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, uh, And so, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, we do it at night, uh, like midnight, and I would plug in, you know, my computer, and he's like, uh, to the interface, and he'll be recording his basses, and, and, um, and that was really cool. And then I had Ty, and Ty actually came to Tommy D a couple times, because he's a great guitar player. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, I can see Ty play this riff here and 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 these uh and he can come up with like a guitar thing like in between those two sections and all this. So it was fun having him too. And and the video, uh um that's that was an uh, the, the videographer, uh, mm-hmm. uh the filmmaker idea like oh i can see you guys are all would all wear suits and i'll just you know let me just film you so 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 we did that for fun uh and it was really cool to just have the whole family participate because my my daughter now is a, a great drummer too so um, there you go so yeah we were like we don't need anybody we have a full band right here <laughs> you got the whole band right here in the house <laughs> man well, that is you perfect know, during- COVID and lockdown, that was really convenient. So (laughs) it's pretty much what you need, right? Well, listen, I know everybody is going to really enjoy the record if they haven't heard it already. Mothers Uh, of a New Nation, uh, Spotify, Apple Music. And Chloe, thank you so much for your time. It's really been been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate. uh, Thank you. And uh, yeah, and hope you all listen to the record. And uh, it was really, it was also a bumpy road to get it to the finish line, but we we did it. And uh, and uh, yeah awesome work and we'll send you along the finished product for this interview as well so thanks again for your time thank you so much big shout out to chloe trujillo for coming on the podcast make sure to go check out her brand new album mothers of a new nation available everywhere on streaming services of course her website And if you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to subscribe, whether you're tuned in on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, make sure to click that little notification bell right next to the button to get all of the real-time updates about everything I'm doing on this podcast. If you want more of me, uh, because I'm posting probably three podcasts a month right now at this point, doing as much as I can while I'm still getting my head straight, from the accident, injury, um, you can catch me every single week on Sound Mojo, my podcast powered by Watch Mojo. We have some incredible guests on there as well, and a lot of fun content, including music trivia on this day in music history, a lot of cool segments. I'm putting a lot of work in there too, um, but you know we have some awesome stuff coming on this podcast. I'm coming for another big, big run, folks. 2020, I had a mad tear. We did some crazy guests lined up back to back to back. And I'm coming back like a motherfucker to hit you guys because we're going crazy. 
So what I'm bringing for you guys uh, this next couple weeks is going to be a tidal wave. I'm back. I'm reclaiming the throne. My head's feeling strong. It's feeling good. And nobody can fucking stop us. We're untouchable right now. So shout out to all you guys. Love you very much. Until next time, this is Cassius Morris saying, rock on.